Well, I hope you enjoyed part one. Uh, today, we're going to have a look at part two of Australia's economic collapse. So the RBA and consensus narrative that you'll hear from, you know, all these mainstream economists and whatnot is that lower interest rates drive business investment and therefore job creation. Austrian economics say that is rubbish anyway. Um, except the problem is um, business investment, and we'll see it here, business investment, uh, excluding mining, has plummeted since the GFC despite interest rates falling from 7.25% to 0.1%. Now, Austrian economics and even Professor Richard Werner argue that artificially lowering interest rates below the free market price does not drive business investment, but actually creates a misallocation of scarce resources and malinvestment. And what it does is, is it encourages people into speculative and non-productive assets. Now, speaking of non-productive assets, one part of the Aussie economy, um, you know, the non-mining, digging stuff out, shipping it overseas, is property. Now, Keynesians that run the RBA, uh, that are right across, you know, academia here, and uh, actually we're getting more MMTs here in Australia, which is quite scary in academia. But what our economy what what our economics is 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 the wealth effect it's the wealth effect it's uh <clears throat> you know what let's increase asset prices people will then feel rich so they'll go and borrow against that asset to then go and buy things and and consume uh by the way the the, the word consume literally means to destroy uh so think of that so we have this wealth effect, all right? That's what our economy is kind of based on, partly based on. Now, try putting these two sentences together with a straight face. The wealth effect is greater in Sydney, but people in Sydney are poorer. See, this is the thing, is you might get away with it for, for a while, but that that is lazy economics. It it does not last long term. It, it, it is not sustainable. And so what we're doing right now is we're loading up young people, first home buyers who've just, and you'll see in my next video how much they've jumped into the property market at such high prices. And, and you'll see how much of their income, their net disposable income after tax is going to mortgage repayments just to, just to have a roof over their head. And it's such a large portion that they've got less disposable income to save, to invest uh, into, you know, maybe into their own business and then that grows and, and then they employ people and they've got less money to consume. They've got less money to spend. So we are beginning that point where we've hit this, uh, you know, wealth effect issue that, you know, because we've got record low interest rates. Um, we've got super high asset prices, house prices. And the wealth effect is now wearing off. And uh, But politicians and uh, central bankers are too gutless to actually uh, reform uh, in, a, in a meaningful way because there's going to be pain to add because we've been, we've been just partying up like no tomorrow. Uh, living off debt, um, you know, other countries being creating wealth by actually making things and selling it to us. They then get our dollars and then they can go and use those dollars to buy assets. <clears throat> yeah, while well, we think we're getting rich, but all we're doing is digging a, a deeper and deeper debt hole. Um, so I thought I'd share a tweet that, uh, that I tweeted <clears throat> the other week. Uh, high interest rates would be good for the country, says Yellen. But Tulip says low interest rates are good for the country. Which is it? Now, those of you who don't know who Tulip is, that is Dr. Tulip, who was a senior economic advisor to the RBA, um, 
uh, he's arguing that uh, low interest rates are good for the country. Uh, Janet Yellen says that high interest rates are good for the country. So which is it? Now, you'll see in my next video uh, where I talk a little bit more about uh, Dr. Tulip. Uh, I, I, now he's no longer there. He's he's a little bit more active on Twitter. And I do bug him a little bit, try to try to bait him into a debate. But he at this point, he hasn't bitten. Uh, and that's probably because he's... Uh, <sighs> His record kind of speaks for itself, and you'll see in my next video. All right, so when we get to the employment, uh, this is Roy Morgan's employment. Now, for May, they said uh, uh, that um, employment, unemployment actually went up to 10.3% after JobKeeper, the, uh, the um, government uh, wage subsidies ended. Uh, that that actually the unemployment rate went up 10.3%. Where the ABS, the ABS, um, and that BS stands for something, uh, came out uh, just last week and said that uh, unemployment's 5.1%. Um, now, I'll put a link in the description below to the ABS uh, numbers here. Now, it'd be interesting to see what the, uh, sorry, uh, Roy Morgan's numbers It'd be interesting to see what uh, Roy Morgan's next numbers uh, look like. But you can see the difference between how uh, Roy Morgan and the ABS um, calculate these numbers. So uh, there's unemployed or people that did not work at all in the month of May, and the ABS counted them as employed. So, yeah. Um, and the U.S. has the same with the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. The U.S. have similar issues with accurate reporting there. Um, so, yeah, and, and apparently Queensland there, uh, which is my state, uh, we've got unemployment over 15%. We're the worst, according to Roy Morgan. And uh, we suspect that's because of, um, you know, we were heavily, um, although we weren't the highest uh, receiving the, the wage subsidies, we were the third highest state. But uh, but we, we do have a lot of uh, uh, tourism and, and stuff like that, and that's probably uh, hospitality as well, and that's probably been um, you know the, the largest um, industry uh, affected due to the lockdowns and whatnot. So coming back to the construction sector, uh, so the construction sector um, employs nine percent of the Australian workforce so this is why the government did what they did with home builder and uh, all the schemes was it was less about in my opinion it was less about um bidding up house prices or getting people into their home or, or whatnot um, there might have been some of that but it was really about um uh jobs Jobs, you know, uh, a sector nine percent of the economy was was about to suffer significantly. The Masters Builders Association uh, went to the government and said that we're expecting a fifty percent plus drawdown, um, and a lot of people are going to go go under. And uh, you know, so you know, when you got over one point two million uh, Australians employed in this sector. Um, that's gonna that's gonna send unemployment up in a, in a big way. So, I I understand why the government did what they did. I just, yeah, we'll leave it at that. However, with uh, builders now, you know they they've locked into contracts at fixed prices, yet their costs are going up. Uh, there's a lot of builders out there that have to uh, honor those contracts at a loss. So build a house at a loss. And I know a builder who's right next door to me. Hopefully they're not watching this video. They've employed a, another builder who had something like 400 contracts to build houses. And eventually they're all going to be at a loss. And he just closed his doors. He now works as a, as a PAYG, as an employee for the builder who's in our office. So anyway, hopefully they're not uh, listening to this video or watching it. So we're, we're, look, we're expecting more of this over the next coming twelve months. Um, you know, there's a lot of pain to be had. Now, one of the other things that happened last year that the government did was um, basically you could trade while insolvent. Um, 
which I still think is going to have a big impact as, as time goes on because you, we had companies who were basically insolvent that, are, that are, were allowed to trade and, and, and do business with other healthy companies. And so when those other healthy companies then you know want to get paid, but those insolvent companies go, oh, actually, yeah, no, nah, we're, we're winding up. Uh, then that impacts those healthy companies because those unhealthy companies were allowed to continue operating. And we're now seeing uh, that business credit defaults are now up 9%. And this is this is data that's just come out from Creditor Watch um, last week. So, you know, watch this space, folks. The economy is not healthy. No matter what you see on mainstream news and what you hear from the government spinning uh, the absolute rubbish um, the, the underlying uh, fundamentals of the economy are actually sick. In fact, this is uh, a perfect picture that sums up where we are. The, the economy is fat, the economy is sick, uh, while the markets look like they're booming. Um, there, there is there's no correlation between the markets and the, the economy. No fundamental correlation anyway. So when we look at the net international investment positions a net international investment position uh, measures the gap between a nation's stock of foreign assets and a foreigner's stock of that nation's assets it can be viewed as a nation's balance sheet with the rest of the world at a specific point in time uh, it's also an important barometer of a nation's financial condition and credit worthiness so um, <clears throat> here you can see Australia has a uh, negative uh, international net international investment position of 53 percent so a nation with a positive uh asset position is uh investment position sorry is a creditor nation while a nation with a negative is a debtor nation and so you can see that australia uh is uh, a negative uh there and uh, along with the united states um, which is negative 66%. So, so this is also a little bit embarrassing that uh, the number of billionaires in Australia that have political connections, um, you know, there's the argument for free market capitalism and uh, you know, I think through this video with the, you know, the, the distortions in you know, price discovery and, um, and, and the price of money itself um you know it isn't capitalism we, we've got central planning um but we've also got cronyism corporatism so when we've got you know uh the, the third most amount so 65 percent of billionaires have political connections and generally are first to the new newly acquired uh printed currency uh or get government contracts for this and that and yeah, you know, it'd be nice if we truly had free markets where everyone had to fend uh, for themselves and build something from scratch and work hard and, and earn uh, their way rather than having political connections. So at the beginning of the onset of the Cerveza sickness last year and the lockdowns, um, I did a presentation where I shared this because I, I asked a question, are we headed for deflation, stagflation, uh, a zombie economy or hyperinflation. And I shared this, which I thought subbed up my position. So the crisis is created by the, <clears throat> and the subsequent closing of entire economies uh, in a domino effect causing strains on supply chains, as well as a domino of credit events in highly indebted sectors, government bailouts of the large and strategic sectors, as well as citizens with massive loans, grants, and fiscal measures, but leave behind the preservation of supply chains at a global level. We've seen that. As the crisis deepens and lasts longer, governments decide to take protectionist and interventionist measures that further erode supply chains. This period is deflationary initially because money velocity collapses, investment stops, consumption weakens, and citizens try to hold on to the little savings they have. And we did see that for a very short period of time. Uh, the deflationary and indebted spiral is addressed with more liquidity and more debt. Yep. Uh, but by now, the supply chains have been irreparably damaged 
and interventionist measures add to rising inflation and the prices of essential goods and services. The economy remains in stagnation, but prices creep up. That pretty much sums up where I've been for the last 12 months and where I still stand today. And I think we're going to have significant inflation in the years ahead uh, unless central banks uh, significantly raise interest rates. However, if they do, there goes the debt bubble. There goes the uh, everything bubble. There goes asset prices. Um, and enter uh, probably the greatest deflationary bust. Oh, well, definitely since the Great Depression, maybe even worse than that. Will governments and central planners want that on their watch? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. So I think they will just, instead of defaulting on the debt, they'll default on the currency. Um, that's my base case. Uh, I'm willing to change if circumstances change. But at this point, um, yeah, I'm not being spooked by uh, the market uh, with just some words that uh, Chairman Powell said that we may raise rates twice in 2023. We'll see. So in 1999, we had the dot-com bubble. 2008 was the real estate bubble. Will 2021 be the zombie bubble? When the crash comes, the media will tell you that no one could have predicted it. However, uh, anyone that wants to look can see it. And those of you that watch this channel uh, will be able to say, well, no, 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 I saw it. Here we've got zombie companies that are outperforming the S&P 500. Unbelievable. So 30% of companies in the Russell uh, 3000 index can't cover interest payments with their earnings and are effectively zombie corporations. Now, meanwhile, at the same time, we got junk bonds, aka their borrowing, so that's where these companies borrow from, are at their lowest level ever. So 30% can't even make their interest payments, let alone principal payments, while their own borrowing, the junk, uh, high yield market, junk, junk bonds, are at the lowest yield ever. This is what the Fed and central banks have done, along with politicians, is they've utterly distorted the concept of risk and market prices. And this is going to have consequences. We see the uh, negative yields on junk bonds. You know, CPI, 4.95%. And we got yields at what, 3.8? So we've got negative yields on corporate high-yield junk debt. This is insane. This is not a healthy economy, friends. Here we've got US corporate debt, so at least here we've got um, investment-grade debt. Right now, that debt has gone up, uh, albeit coming down slightly uh, based on this chart, Uh, yet yields at all-time lows. Yields at all-time lows. So... You know, if yields rise while well, we've got such high corporate debt, we're going to have so many more zombie companies and eventually failures. Uh, and then there's governments and then there's households. I mean, <clears throat> we are in an almighty debt bubble. And speaking of debt bubbles, China warns of a global financial bubble that could burst. When we have a look at the article, Uh, You can see just in the uh, bold highlighted part there. So uh, recent interest rate hikes by emerging economies could lead to a bursting of global financial asset bubbles, which have been made even bigger by unprecedented easing measures by developed countries, Biden's trillions and ScoMo's hundreds of billions. Or, you know, we're now one trillion in debt. Um, So these have the potential to result result in the repricing of global assets. <clears throat> Gee, I love talking too much. Uh, in short, China is already preemptively pointing the finger at the US and when Western central banks as the parties responsible not only for bursting the biggest asset bubble in history, but for creating it in the first place. Now, this will be the first and only time that you'll ever see me agree with China. However, they have some responsibility as well. They've, they've 
they've done the same thing. They, they've built a big uh, bubble in China as well. So, you know, a bit of hypocrisy there. But, but they are right that, that central banks around the West uh, will be res- responsible for bursting the biggest asset bubble in history. But they're the people who started it in the first place, which makes me angry. All right, so let's uh, wrap up this video now. I uh, wanted to share a few um, tweets uh, from some uh, very smart people. So this is Dr. Michael Burry. Just tweeted this out late last week. All hype speculation is doing is drawing in retail before the mother of all crashes. FOMO parabolas don't resolve sideways when crypto falls from trillions. Mean stocks fall from tens of billions. Main Street losses will approach the size of countries. History ain't changed. And his mate, well, it must be a, the big short theme or something. Uh, ben Rickett, what the US government wants to do is postpone the crash as long as they possibly can so they don't have sober up to the voters. The only thing that will stop the currency printing is a dollar crash. History has played this movie before. It's titled John Law and the Mississippi Bubble. Um, at least I like what... Uh, um, Ben says he, he doesn't use the word money printing. He says currency printing. So uh, good good on you. Ben Rickett again. Uh, Rudolf von Havenstein. 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 Germany's central banker during the Weimar hyperinflation bought all the government's debt, bailed out bankrupt companies, and printed exponential amounts of currency. He sincerely believed it would work. We all know how that ended. Kind of sounds a bit familiar today, doesn't it? And... Let's not forget that his buddy, Dr. Michael Burry, is actually predicting hyperinflation. And uh, Professor Richard Werner says hyperinflation 2023. So let's uh, uh, watch this space. And Danielle DiMartino Booth, who was an economic advisor to the Fed, for the, to the Dallas branch, uh, says rental inflation looks to be picking up steam. This does not fall into the flexible bucket in any way. This is the worst type of inflation the largest item of any U.S. household budget. That is the last thing they want to see. Now, we are seeing the same thing in Australia. Uh, We are seeing uh, all sorts of shortages in the rental market, the property market, and uh, we've seen rental prices go up significantly. However, I don't believe that gets picked up in the CPI. So, uh, yeah, um, you know, the government and all that will be able to go, yeah, yeah, no, CPI is under control. However, this is the largest item of any Australian budget, budget, not just uh, US budget. Uh, Austrian economist Daniel Lacau, same people that hail massive. Daniel, why are you using the word money printing some? I'm going to have to teach you it's currency. Uh, And huge central bank intervention complain now that inflation is increasing inequality. I agree, it's so frustrating. And Michael Goodwell, so this is on the back of uh, Jerome Powell, uh, his announcement last week. Inflation could turn out to be higher and more persistent than we expect. Oh, duh. Longer term inflation expectations appear broadly consistent with Fed goal. Okay. Uh, Would be prepared to adjust policy if inflation expectation moved too high. Yeah, we'll see. Two rate hikes in 2023 means tapering is certain to start early next year. Uh, perhaps market only expected one hike in 2023. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And uh, Daniel again, if inflation is transitory, why hike rates twice in 2023? Because the Fed does not see it as transitory. And I'll put a link in the description to this article, Why Stimulus Does Not Stimulate. And as you all know, uh, I... Study Austrian economics. I'm a big uh, promoter of it. Um, You know, being, uh, I I like this picture when it came up, being an ex-rugby league player. uh, I still work out at the gym uh, maybe three or four times a week. Uh, However, I spend a lot more time working out my brain, uh, reading and studying uh, as much as I can from the Mises Institute. And I'll put a link in the description below to their library uh, where you can download hundreds of free eBooks. Uh, And I highly recommend 
that anyone who is interested in, in economics at all or, or just investing or finance in general uh, that, that just wants to have a sound understanding of how the economy works and 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 then use that to, to make sound investment decisions. I can't recommend Austrian economics highly enough. And, uh, and, and so feel free, go to the Mises Institute library and download uh, some books. Uh, Henry Hazlitt's Economic in One Lesson. You can get a hard co copy from the Mises Institute at the moment for free. Um, I've ordered uh, tens of probably close to 80 or 90 of those books to give out to my students and, and other people here in Australia. So I thank the Mises Institute for what they do. And uh, that's my opinion on the Australian economy. I think it's uh, very sick and uh, time will, will show just how sick it is. Uh, we can keep kicking the can down the road, but eventually the can gets too big and uh, and the piper has to be paid. And uh, anyway, I will go into more depth on the property market and how that's going to impact the economy as well uh, in my next video. So stay tuned to that. Uh, if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up, hit that like button. I know it's been a long one and I thank you for, for you know, watching it through to the end. Uh, take care, everyone, and I'll see you again on another episode of Finance Uncut.